Hello and welcome to TTELT, -E Teaching Tips for English Language Teachers. I'm Dr. Gina Rhodes. Let's get started. This week in TTLT, -E we have writing tips from Laura Connor. Laura Connor was an English language fellow in Mongolia, and now she's a teacher in a high school in New York, as well as doing teacher training workshops. Or why don't you tell us a little bit about writing? You said that you have, you're doing some writer's checklist. Can you explain what that is to us? Sure. Um, so I developed this writer's checklist through a design thinking program at, at the Dwight School, which was pretty cool. It basically encourages teachers to take um, some sort of challenge that they face uh, either with teaching or they notice that their students taste it, um, face and come up with a solution to it. And so I feel as a English language teacher, one of the biggest challenges my students have is with writing and especially academic writing. And so I found that when we would be editing or working on their other class papers together, so for example, a science report or an English essay or a history research paper, um, we would edit and revise together. And then a few weeks later, we would edit and revise a different paper, but that student would still be making the same mistakes. And so um, to tackle that, I came up with a writer's checklist, which basically um, is a more strategic way to target areas that the student is consistently making mistakes with. So rather than edit every little thing on the paper, choose two or three specific um, areas for punctuation, grammar, word choice, for example, sentence structure. So you would only choose three specific areas. So let's just say ver verb tense. That student makes a lot of mistakes with verb tense. So I would only focus on maybe that and one other thing with them. And we would just focus on those until they felt like they had a better command of that skill. Um, and the purpose of the writer's checklist is then that's a list that's documented. And so the student can use that as a tool to help them while they're writing. So ideally they'll have that next to them while they're writing or editing um, their own paper. So they're, they're building those independent skills so that they don't just need me every time to help them with their editing. They can start to do it by themselves. Um, and so in addition to that, that checklist would be shared with their classroom teachers so that they could collaborate with us and only focus on those areas. So again, that student doesn't feel overwhelmed by a paper covered in, in red and edits and all his or her mistakes, but they are just focusing on specific areas of writing. That's great. Yeah, and I like that you as the ESL teacher are sharing that with their regular classroom teacher. And so everybody's on the same page. Like this is this is our focus right now. Right. Let's not overwhelm this poor child. We want to just focus on this yes. issue to this week. Yeah. Right. And actually a part of the reason why I came up with this was because oftentimes these classroom teachers would ask me, how do I go about editing so and so's paper? Because I I, you know, they realized that they felt like they were just covering it in red and you know how productive can that really be if I got a paper cover in red I'd probably just want to throw it out so um they find it really helpful too and they, I think they feel relieved to just focus on on those things uh, rather than have to edit every single little thing on their paper so yeah, I think it would help everybody involved. And yeah. so so that's how that's why you started the checklist was to be able to communicate better with the classroom teacher. Yeah, that that and I think to build the students independence to because I just felt like they would come into my room and just be like, please help with this paper. And so I wanted to give them the tools to start to be able to do it without so much help from me. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Can you give us an example of an activity that you've done with these checklists? So there's lots, um, you know, it would depend on the area of writing that you want to focus on. So let's just say, for example, which is pretty common, I would say with English language learners, um, the area of word choice. So 
you know, again, they're building their vocabulary and so they might not have access to as many words as native speakers. Um, but also learning like how to be creative and, and kind of play with their sentences and words a little bit. Um, so I might start with a mentor text, uh, maybe like a paragraph, or like for example, from The Outsiders, Essie Hinton has really nice language and she uses lots of descriptive word choice. And so we would read that and we would analyze it and we would maybe go through and circle every adjective. So with that, the students have previously learned adjectives and descriptive words. They then do a word search for adjectives. Um, and we talk about how that adds to her writing. How does that make her writing more interesting? And then the students go back to one of their own writing pieces um, and they have to do a similar activity. And when they do that, they themselves then realize like, oh, I'm, I'm not really using very many adjectives or when I do, I use the same adjective over and over again. And so it kind of is a good way for them to just see this area of writing that they, they can work on. Um, and so then from there, we would continue on and practice descriptive writing and really focus on word choice and keep coming back to word choice. Um, and along the way, how the writer's checklist is used is the students, when they go through their paper, they can identify an example sentence that they need to fix, and they add that example sentence to their checklist. So now when they're, again, because the goal is to have them use it independently, they, they can see an example of what needed to be fixed and also how they fixed it. That's a great idea. Okay, so that, so their actual writing is in the checklist? Yeah. And then the correction is there, like you made this mistake and this is, this is how we fixed it. Uh, yes. I think that's excellent. Uh, an excellent addition to the checklist. So they have that right there and be like, oh yeah, last time I made this mistake. I don't want right. to do that again. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And I think too, that's even more helpful when it comes to grammar where maybe they, they forget this rule or this irregular verb that keeps tripping them up. Um, so I think it's it's extra helpful with grammar and sentence structure. Yeah, I like having that actually, the sentence actually there in the list because I've used checklists a little bit in the past, but I haven't, I hadn't thought of putting their actual mistakes and correction right there for them to see when they do it next yeah. time. You know, sometimes we rush through... <laughs> Once we're done editing something, we just want to move on and do the next version, but then we're not learning from the mistakes. And so I, I have found that's an important part of the process for, for my students. Yeah, I think that would have a lot of extra benefits for the students. Yeah. And so are there other benefits of the checklist that you want to tell us about? Sure. I mean, I think just this, the skill of, of editing and revision, again, it's, maybe something that isn't given enough attention sometimes. And so it really empowers students to, to feel like they can become better writers, even without, you know, their ESL teacher sitting next to them. Um, so I think it, it gives them that kind of critical eye when they're rereading their own work for how to make it better. But I also think it motivates them to want to be better writers. They, they, I have found that with this checklist and with these writing units, um, by the they're really, you know, passionate about writing a really good descriptive paragraph because you're just giving them that one thing to focus on. So it doesn't feel as intimidating. Um, so I, I think that's probably the biggest benefit is it's just really empowering them to want to be better writers and feeling like they can be better writers. That's excellent. Well. Well, the more we can empower them, the better. Yeah, um, absolutely. And what are some things that you wish you had known when you first started using checklists? What are some some of its uh, different versions that you've gone through? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I think a few things. Number one, it does take time. It's, it's, it's uh, one of the more arduous things I have to do as a teacher because I have to be patient um, and it is something that takes a full class period and then afterwards multiple class periods. But I have to remind myself that that's okay. It's okay that they're not, um, you know, maybe getting 
as much content as sometimes we feel we need to teach because they're really developing their own skills. Um, I think that I very quickly realized that before I can use the writer's checklist, students need to understand the writing, the five-step writing process um, of, of brainstorming, drafting, outlines, um, or sorry, outlines and then drafting, editing, revision, another draft. You know, if a lot of students, when I would start these units, really didn't know the difference between editing and revision. And so that alone took a little bit of time to really teach and have them understand. Um, so I would say that's very important. I would say something else that I wish I had known beforehand was um, that some students are going to be really excited about this. And some students, it is, it takes time and patience and maybe um, they don't buy in as quickly, but to just keep going with it and, and trust that it works. So. So patience and persistence, okay. <laughs> yes, which I feel like with writing, you really need a lot of patience and persistence, no matter what level of education you're at, so. Yes, yes. If you want to see your students improve, it takes a lot of that. Yes, yeah. yes. For you okay. and them. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> All right. Was there anything else you wanted to say about um, your checklist? Um, I think that's it. And again, I think it's, I use it digitally. My checklist is digital, but it's also something that can be done on paper. So I think it's easy to, you know, it's very flexible. Like you can change it to meet the needs of your learners. So how can teachers encourage their students to work on their language outside of class when they're not with you? Um, I think for me, the kind of best thing that I have found is is really just building those relationships with my students and kind of getting to know their interests. Um, whether that be through like the beginning of the year, I like to write my students a letter to tell them about myself and they have to write one back to me. It's a nice way just to scratch the surface, but um, really kind of pinpointing students' interests and then giving them English-related activities or readings or podcast that might match that activity. Um, so for example, I have a student who loves um, working with Legos and building with Legos. He's really <laughs> very into it. Um, and so I've actually found some cool articles and podcasts on that. A lot of my students um, love soccer. And so that's um, something that there's so much out there, again, whether it be a podcast or articles or even, you know, showing them ESPN online and you can watch all these newsreels. Um, I think if you give them language learning and something they're interested in, they're way more likely to use that outside of the classroom, so. That's really good advice. Yeah. I think the more we know what our students' interests are, the more we can really steer them in the right direction for things that are going to help them improve and also things that they, they want to learn about anyway. So they learn about right. it in any language. Yeah. Right. And they're often topics they want to be talking to their friends about in English. And, you know, then you're giving them that language to be able to do that. So I think that's another benefit for them. Do you have any specific tips for teachers whose first language is in English? Sure. I mean, I think a lot of the things that we talked about as far as, um, you know, online tools or developing vocabulary is equally as important for adults who are learning English. But I think that, um, you know, to finding ways outside of work to develop their English and expand their vocabulary. Um, so, you know, maybe starting a book club, whether that be with other teachers or um, if there are native speakers in your school or in the area, um, that's a really nice, fun way to develop your language skills. There's so much you can do with books. You know, you can practice your fluency, you can develop your vocabulary, you can have discussions. And so, 
Um, plus I think there's just so many great books out there and it's a nice way also to learn about culture. And, um, so I think that's probably for me, one of the biggest suggestions I would make to develop your own language. So where can teachers find you? Um, so teachers could feel free to email me. Uh, my email is L like Laura. L Connor C O N N O R 416 at gmail.com. Um, I also have a English language learning website that does have some um, tools for teachers. It has tools for students. It has some fun videos for my travels. Um, and so that website is LC Learning, which is E L L C S E E Learning dot weebly.com. Wow, Laura had so many great ideas to help with our writing. I love her checklists and I think that they really can be useful to help our students improve their writing. Um, I think that it is important, of course, that we teach the students the five-step writing process first. Even if you break some of those down into more steps or fewer steps, it's still important to make sure that your students know first we brainstorm, then we outline, then we draft then we write it again, and then we finally edit at the end. So these are, are all so many things that we need to um, teach our students how to do and to practice often and to be patient with them while they're learning. Yeah, And I love that her checklists have several different things that the students could be working on, but that um, each student just picks maximum three categories that they're going to focus on. So that I think that really helps no matter how many teachers that student has, even if it's just you or if there is a, another mainstream teacher that you're working with, not having the student know that this is what we're focusing on um, will be really helpful. But it also helps you as a teacher that you don't feel necessary that you have to correct every single mistake that the student makes. You can focus in on that one thing and makes it less overwhelming for everyone. You just say, this is what we're, we're focusing on today. And I really love the idea of including those students' sentences and say, this is a thing that you make a mistake on often. And this is the mistake you made last time. And this is how you fixed it. And then when they do writing again, they can look at that while they're looking at their checklist and go, okay, I need to remember that I often make mistakes with using past tense. I need to go back and check that I'm using past tense when I should be using past tense. Or I usually forget the um, irregular verb endings and I need to double check and make sure that I'm using this verb in the correct way. So things like that, I think are really helpful for students. I think that's a great addition to the traditional writer's checklist. And of course, she talked about patience and she said that she uses a lot of her class time to really make sure that they understand how to use the checklist and how it can help them as writers. And I loved that the students were telling her that, you know, now they really want to become better writers because they understand how they can become better writers. Sometimes it just becomes so overwhelming, but when you break it down and you show them this specific parts, um, then it helps them to really want to improve and to make their writing clear to their readers and to make it better. So I think that that was fabulous. That was a great top teaching tips. Yeah, she's got lots of great tips. Lots of more events from TTLT and our workshop this weekend is going to be Eileen's workshop on using music in the classroom. And if you haven't had a chance to watch or listen to her episode, on music, then I re highly recommend that you do. And she's going to give you lots more hands-on experience and some ways to use music with your students. So I hope that you'll be able to join us Friday, February 26th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for this amazing workshop. And also so excited that we're going to have our second TTLT talk. And this one is going to be Saturday, February 27th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And this month we're going to be talking about the topics you told us you wanted to discuss. So um, Saturday, February 27th at 5 p.m. we're going to have, um, in addition to our 
other talks, we're going to have three breakout rooms where we're going to talk about transitioning from online to face-to-face -face and back and forth. As many of you told us that this is something you're having to do right now and this is a challenge. So we're going to have a room that's dedicated to that. So if this is one of your challenges, please come and um, get some ideas. Um, if you've come up with some good solutions, you can share them with your colleagues. And if they've come up with some good solutions, they can share them with you. So you can share ideas on how to do that transition from online to face-to-face. -to -face. And we're also going to be talking about teaching critical thinking. This is a really important skill for our students to learn. So there are lots of different ways that we can teach critical thinking. And um, when you come to this room, your colleagues will be discussing some challenges and solutions that they've had with critical thinking. So you can share ideas there. The third room is going to be on motivating our students. So again, another challenge that we have is how to keep all your students motivated. So if you're in this room, you will be talking with the other colleagues that would like to discuss this challenge um, with you so, so they can talk about some of their solutions and you can share some of yours and you can uh, discuss together. So this is what we'll be doing this Saturday um, at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So please come. If you haven't signed up yet, go to our events page on ttlt.org and sign up for this event and all of our other events as well as our competition. So we're having a competition this month and in this competition, the grand prize is to be able to attend the virtual TESOL International Convention, which is March 24th to 27th. And you'll also get a global TESOL membership so that you can attend all the events that TESOL has for a year. So this is um, the um, the, you will win a, you will get a chance to win this if you participate in our competition. Um, you may also uh, get a chance to participate in our professional development course through Northwest Nazarene University. So this is a one credit university course. So you'll learn more about both of these things as well um, as see them, they're all going to be on our website starting March 1st. So we're launching the campaign on March 1st. So you can get details about this competition and the new professional development course um, on our website um, as of March 1st, as well as in our TTLT Facebook group. So if you haven't joined our Facebook group, you can join and we will be discussing details about um, the conference as um, about the competition to go to the conference as well as the professional development course. So we hope you will you will participate in both the competition and to find out all of the exciting things happening at TTLC. As well, um, we have a workshop coming up on March 12th um, with Daniela Hassa. So hopefully you have had a chance to um, listen or watch Daniela's episode uh, and she's going to be doing a workshop on integrating technology with limited resources. So this is a challenge that many of us have. Most of many of us work in areas that have a limited technology. And so when and when you've got the limited resources and limited technology, then um, these are huge challenges. So she's going to be talking about how she has found some solutions to these challenges. So please come. Friday, March 12th, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and learn from Daniela. We also have Wendy Olson doing a workshop on using songs and rhymes with young learners in low resource environments. So again, this is a challenge for many of us when we're working with our, our students. Uh, we want to use these songs and rhymes, So, and many of us are in low resource environments. So this is really great. Um, workshop that she's going to be leading. So, and again, if you haven't had a chance to listen to her episode, I highly recommend that you do. It's the one of the most recent ones. So, but come to our work, her workshop on Sunday, March 21st at 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and learn more about how to use songs and rhymes in low resource environments. And if you want to get more involved with TTLT, you can always go to our website uh, send us a message there, an email there. Um, you can also subscribe to our podcast and our YouTube channel. 
uh, join our Facebook group at TTLT and follow us on Twitter at TTLT1 and on Instagram at T.T.E.L.T. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.